Uh, hi, I'm William from East Group. Uh, I am a fan of Closure, um, and I've been experimenting a fair bit recently with Closure Script. Closure Script is uh, a language very similar but not quite the same as Closure, and it compiles down to uh, JavaScript. So it runs in the browser, it can also run uh, using Node.js. Um, the main reason Closure Script has been created is to kind of increase the, the reach of the Closure language. So the JVM is pretty good and it's in a lot of places, but nothing is out there as much as uh, JavaScript is because it's in everyone's browsers, right? Uh, another benefit is that if you're running in Node.js, then you don't have any of the overhead time of uh, spinning up the JVM. But uh, JavaScript runtimes have some drawbacks. They're always single-threaded. And so some of the styles of programming that you use quite often in Clojure uh, don't really cross over as well. So uh, I've been kind of trying to get into functional reactive programming a bit or getting a better understanding of how that would work. Uh, and if you're also interested, you should have a chat with Hank here. Who's not wearing his badge today? Normally he's got, I love FRP badges. Yeah, good. Uh, but part of that is, is basically you need code that will run when events happen. So I thought, hey, I'll use Closure Script. It'll be awesome. I'll be able to implement this stuff and use macros to make it look like beautiful. Uh, because there are some reactive, and I think there's even one functional reactive library for JavaScript, but it's still like written in JavaScript, so there's kind of some overheads there, especially when you're creating a lot of different fun functions to process your data as it's kind of streaming through your system. Um, so I had a crack at this in ClojureScript, and straight away I hit a problem, which was that uh, I wanted these lazy blocking sequences that I could use to represent say, all clicks that will ever happen on this page. And something like uh, events, so clicks on a page, you would normally consider to be something that you can't really handle functionally. But uh, if you kind of squint your eyes a bit and tilt your head to the side, I, I think it's safe to say that if you have a collection that represents all clicks that have ever and will ever happen, uh, then that doesn't change, and it's just uh, what uh, time you look into that collection uh, kind of determines what values you get out. Um, and so I found myself implementing uh, these things. So a promise list is conceptually a lazy sequence that you can use to uh, have code block um, as you're processing it, uh, and so you basically get the same kind of usage out of it as you would have uh, in normal closure code by mapping through a, a lazy blocking sequence. Uh, and the way it accomplishes this is through promises. So promises are um, a value that represents a value that will exist in the future. So uh, in normal closure, in normal run times when you can block, uh, you could be passed a promise and you can hand that off to someone else or you can store it or you can actually say, okay, I actually care what the value is now. And normally you'll say, give me the value and then you give me the value always gets the same response. And so the way you accomplish that is by blocking your thread of execution until that value is available. Um, and because it always returns the same response, uh, it's considered functional. Uh, do you differentiate between promises and features? Uh, is sorry. So in this case, I'm using promises and features kind of interchangeably. I believe the distinction is that promises are asynchronous features. So to get a value out of a promise, you need to pass it a function that it will then call back with the value, whereas with the future, that will actually block. But uh, I'm not totally sure about that. That may be incorrect. Do you know? 
in, in Scala, uh, the, the promise is sort of a, you, you, you get to put in a value for other people to consume, whereas the future is sort of a thing that you're getting the value out. Uh -huh. But I don't know, I, other people have heard just, they talk about promises of the futures and the way that you're using it, so I, yep. I'm not sure how to sort of get there. Okay, so the, I'll kind of use them interchangeably. I believe there is like a, a fairly stick strict definition. Uh, there is also uh, deferred objects, uh, which um, I have used in the implementation of this. So a promise, you can't ever put the value in. It's kind of a read-only object, whereas the deferred is the same as a promise. You can get the value out or you can put it in. Uh, and deferred objects are now used um, to, to represent like Ajax calls in jQuery, um, I think something similar is used for like file system access in Node.js. Um, so it's just a good way of getting a value out without like bringing the whole runtime to a to a halt. Uh, so I'll kind of go through my code here. Uh, so this uh, is an example of some usages of, of promise lists and just I guess showing how you interact with them. So I've defined a function open plist that returns back a pair. There is a reader and a writer. So the reader is a purely functional view of all of the events that will never that will ever happen. Um, it's impossible to ever call a function on the reader and get like different responses out. Um, the, the yeah and. So the reader is a seek, you should say that? Yeah. The reader is, yeah, a sequence. And the writer uh, is a value that you can pass to some of my functions to add values to the end of the list. Um, and readers can't know about those values until they're in the list. Um, and I feel like that makes it functional. Uh, so to add something to a list, you uh, just append it. Um, you can only ever append promises to lists, uh, and this kind of gives you some power in that you can order things on the list before you have the actual values. So I, throughout the library, try and maintain the order of uh, values even when they're being transformed. So if you take in, say, a list of URLs and map over that and do an AJAX request to each of those URLs, then you'll get back a sequence of promises that represent all of the uh, response values from the AJAX requests. And those promises will be in the order of your original URLs rather than being in the order that the responses came back. And that gives you some power in that you can uh, refer to things kind of that are going to happen in the future. You can compare them to where you are now. So for instance, you may want to um, only render values if like the next request hasn't come back yet to avoid updating the page too much. Uh, and you can do that by taking uh, the tail of this list, so everything bar the head value, uh, the rest of the list, zipping those together and then iterating over the pairs and being like, well, render this guy if the next one hasn't come back yet. And that's the kind of processing that would be very difficult to handle if you were doing a normal uh, callback style. Uh, so once you've appended, you can get values out. So uh, here we appended puppies, and when we call first on the reader end, we'll get out a promise, and we can then call done on the promise and register a callback. So this uh, hash and then an expression syntax is a the terse syntax for a for a lambda enclosure. Uh, and so log will get called when we have the value, uh, which would be uh, which would be puppies, I guess. Yeah. And uh, it will print that out. 
So sorry, first reader returns a promise. Yes. And then done X on yeah. So that's but that's an extension that you put in because that's not closure promises, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. uh, so I'm under the hood using jQuery promises. I intend to define or like I think there's some work that's been done thinking about what a promise interface should look like in Clojure, but it's not really in there yet. So well, probably Clojure has promises, but they're different. They don't have that done. I believe uh, Clojure script doesn't, but yeah. yes, yep. Yeah. Uh, so I'll probably change my implementation of promises to instead of being against the concrete thing, uh, I'll define a, a um, protocol and then write my code against that protocol and then you'll be able to swap out the implementation of promises. Um, yep, yeah, good. So this is kind of interacting with it like you would uh, a normal sequence. You can pull out the first value. Uh, and if you pull out first again, you will get the same value. So uh, this is a, an immutable collection. You're not kind of processing this thing. You don't, you don't change the sequence at all. Uh, and first will always give you the same response. Um, so this would be uh, puppies again. Uh, you can also look ahead. So if I've only called append once on this sequence, then there's only one value in there. Uh, but I can use nth three to one, which will get, so if it's zero index, then one is the second value. Uh, so I can use this to refer to the second value in the sequence, which doesn't exist yet. And I can register a callback, so we can log out the second value. I've registered a callback, but we don't have that value yet. So when we actually append a second value, when we put ducklings in the list, then our logger will be called and it will print out ducklings. Uh, so this is kind of thinking about the future and you can write code that is um, checking that events will happen or even comparing what has happened with what should happen in the future. Yes? Uh, because the payload of the, uh, the scheduling uh, is happening asynchronously, it, it has to be a side fix wrong because there's nothing to, to return the value back to. Uh, um, so, so with the, the ducklings, actually, no, sorry, the, the, the ducklings is the, the promise value you've got. Yeah, sorry, I'm not confused. That's fine. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so you, you do end up in this situation where your callbacks happen outside of the normal thread of execution, and so you can't have a value in a callback get returned back to the rest of your code. <coughs> so it's kind of like once you're in callback land, you're stuck there forever, and all you can ever do is have more callbacks, which is callback hell. It's like well understood, and like I think it's kind of the thing that keeps people away from normal Node.js programming yeah, yeah. Uh, is you end up with this deeply nested code that's got a lot of state floating around. Uh, and this library hopes to remedy that somewhat. If, if the promise value is already there, will it run the payload immediately and yes. synchronously? Yes. Um, but if it's not there yet, it'll... It'll, it'll wait. Work. Yes. It'll work. Okay, so it's not basically. Uh, it is it's 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 it will continue to the next execution line. Yeah. But the function that you're typing on it oh, right. will yeah. call, get called at the later point. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Uh, it, nothing blocks, nothing can block in JavaScript. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, good. So the, these sequences aren't necessarily infinite. Uh, you can easily use this to represent infinite sequences, or you can close your writer. Um, so if we're, say, you have some pop-up dialog and you have something that's interested in when you're clicking on the pop-ups, but the pop-up dialog will go away eventually, then it makes sense to close that list of events. Uh, similarly, you could use this to represent, say, network activity where you're being sent packets. Um, and so these things do have a definite ending uh, the advantage of close here is um, that you can reduce over these sequences. So reduce will uh, only ever really return a value once it hits the end. Um, and you can, I have implemented reduce for these sequences. Um, and it means 
kind of everything's much the same as it would be normally. Uh, so all of my examples are kind of following on from each other. So if I've put in uh, <coughs> kittens and ducklings and then closed the sequence, um, it is possible to actually ask for a value beyond the end of the sequence. Uh, and of course, you can do that before it's closed and you have to be able to do it after it's closed because uh, if that behavior changed, then this structure wouldn't be functional. Um, and you can actually do it with, with normal sequences in closure. So you can say, uh, give me the 50th element of a list that only has two elements and it will return nil. So uh, in Thomas lists, uh, you can ask for something that's past the end and it will return back a promise that contains the value nil. And so if you've asked for a bunch of these values before the sequence was called, uh, when, sorry, before close was called on the sequence, when close is called, then all of those promises will resolve and they will all be nil at the same time. Uh, so, in the first slide, I created an open plist, but uh, creating something that's closed from the beginning is quite useful as well. Um, I use it uh, a great deal in my testing because it would be annoying to create something open and then append some values to it and then close it. So this creates uh, just a normal list that always exists in memory and has a definite close even from the beginning. And uh, so here we we just put owlet, which is a, a baby owl, which I thought was quite cute, uh, in a list, and then you can access it just like the normal promised list, um, which is good. Uh, some of my other functions also expect that you return lists of promises, and so having a closed plist means that you can satisfy that requirement without ever really needing to like you know, fire off Ajax requests or something. So say you're uh, doing a map cat or a, a flat map if you're familiar with Haskell or Ruby, uh, then each level needs to return back a list of values. And that list might be empty or might just contain one value or may contain many. Uh, there is map cat for promised lists and so you need to be able to wrap up normal values in these promised lists so that it can be flattened down into a into a sequence. Uh, so here, um, uh, this is a just using a higher order function over the sequence. Um, so here we have uh, all of the values that will come in. We're then mapping over them and appending a baby to the beginning. So uh, fmap here is a function that takes another function and it kind of lifts it up so that it can operate in this other domain. So in this instance, fmap is taking my string concatenation function and it's making it so that it can accept promises as its arguments and it returns a promise uh, as its return value. Um, and I need to do this because uh, map will be passing in promise values and will be expecting promise values. Um, but with convenience functions, we can quite easily uh, allow existing functions to operate in that kind of environment. Um, and then once we've mapped over it, we get back a lazy sequence. So this stops being a normal plist, like what I've defined and it just becomes a normal closure lazy seek, which is kind of a problem because you can have a lazy seek of promises, but it can never terminate or never know when it's going to terminate. Um, so you can operate it in this way, where you pull out uh, rest first would be the second value. Um, so this would print out uh, baby, some baby animal, uh, but you can't uh, then map over that indefinitely, so you couldn't have a logger sitting there just printing all the values to the screen because it would just go in an infinite loop and map indefinitely. Um, so that's one thing you need to be a bit careful of. 
and it's something that Clojure's reduces library actually resolves. So the reduces library in Clojure, instead of functions like map returning a lazy sequence of values, instead, uh, so here, rmap is the map function from the reduces library, we get past my plus function, and uh, rmap will take plus, and it will actually return back a new version of plus, where the arguments to plus have been incremented. And so it's not doing any sequence processing, it's just changing the reduction function. So that means that map doesn't need to know anything at all about collections, it just needs to know about the, uh, upgrading these functions. Um, and so I've defined a version of reduce that satisfies the uh, closure reduce, uh, I reduce protocol. Uh, and that means that you can actually have versions of map and reduce that will terminate when the promise list gets to the end. Uh, and they'll be kind of synchronized so that your mapping functions get executed as new values become available. So if you choose to have side effects in some of your mapping functions, like rendering to the screen, then they'll all happen at the right time. Uh, so uh, another thing that's maybe worth noting is that each of these functions is kind of creating divergent streams, so they're creating new promise lists, uh, and they can each operate on the previous ones, uh, which is you know, the beauty of functional data structures. So to use the reduces framework, you need to have a reduce at the end of your uh, calls, but that's not like always convenient, like you don't always need to reduce. Uh, and so I have to find some convenience functions. So I have map D here, or map D star, uh, that's kind of like map, except it automatically F maps your function for you. And the star just kind of represents like, this is my slightly different version that operates on D lists. And uh, map D star will return back a proper promise list rather than returning back a, a closure lazy seek. Uh, and in that way, it can be passed on to reduction functions or more mapping, and all of it will uh, retain the ability to know when the sequence is completed. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've implemented the, the monad that represents this data structure, which the main advantage of it is that uh, I've now got code that looks like a normal closure for loop. So uh, if you ignore the reduce, uh, for plist will take each value out of the closed plist and call all of the code beneath it with that value. So this line of code gets run once for one, once for two, once for three, and then it will run all of the code beneath it with its values. So this is generating a new closed plist with the values from A and B, so you can reference back up. Uh, and then at the bottom we've got each value that will go into the new plist. So all of this will actually output uh, a flat sequence with 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6. Um, so that's the kind of uh, map catting that you would expect from a normal for loop, uh, and that can lead to some pretty concise code. So I, I feel like this is kind of satisfied what I had hoped from Closure Scripts that I'd be able to create um, language constructs that look like the built in ones for new data structures, and to write code like this in normal JavaScript, you would need to have a whole bunch of nested callbacks and potentially be kind of mutating these uh, semi-global variables to keep track of where you were in the sequence or to build up uh, new sequences from callbacks. Uh, and this code kind of eliminates all of that and means that you can operate at a, a higher level of abstraction that should lead to less errors, hopefully, and just less cognitive load. 
Uh, so that's my library. I've been hacking on that for a couple of weeks, and it's kind of low-level data structure stuff that I normally don't do as a like primarily web developer. Uh, and it's been fairly pleasant. Uh, ClojureScript is uh, a new language, so uh, debugging in an error messages are uh, like pretty frustrating. I've found myself writing a whole bunch of like log statements on different lines to find out when things were breaking. Uh, but for the most part, it's been like fairly productive. Uh, and I think I'll probably continue on trying to use ClojureScript rather than JavaScript for projects in the future. Um, and it's worked on this partially at Rails camp and uh, partially at work, so I'd like to thank Jono for actually like letting me do cool stuff at work, which is good. Uh, did anyone have, to have any questions? Is it public? It's all public, it's all up on my GitHub page. What's it called? Thomas hyphen list. If Hank ever explains to me what functional reactive programming is, <laughs> maybe we'll be able to use this to build some kind of system that <clears throat> gives us automatic, automatic everything. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a side question, it's sort of related. Have you had a chance to look at the new basic stuff? Yeah, yeah. Got in ClojureScript? <laughs> yeah, so I, I got this to a point where it was kind of useful, and then the next day, the core closure guys basically announced a, a library that does the same thing, so it's kind of... Uh, but mine's heaps better because it's functional. Uh, yeah, but I was going to say it's because it's functional. Yeah, no, no. But it's, it's crash. crash. It's yeah. betraying the core principles. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I think the use case for their stuff is somewhat different. It's to, like, kind of control the rate of production as well as the rate of consumption, which my library doesn't do at all, but... Yeah, what else? Uh, I think this is pretty cool, and it satisfies uh, a function that you have in normal closure code, but that you would normally lose when switching to closure script. And I think that that sequence processing, especially in like lazy code, lazy sequences, is pretty core to the closure style of writing code. And it's a shame to have lost it. Do you have any like um, sample app or something that uses this to do you know something pretty? Uh, I do, and hopefully this projector turns on quickly. Uh, so I wrote a little uh, Flickr quick search thing, and if I have an internet connection, I should be able to actually show you. You've got any public? Shit. Yeah, it's low. I know it. Good. So I like it. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, so this is like 10 lines of code or so that uh, implement like quick search. So I'm hitting the uh, public Flickr APIs and searching for groups that contain group uh, groups whose name contains the string that you type in here. Uh, so Foo gets you the Foo Fighters, Kittens gets you a Kitten Magazine. Uh, and all of this is um, operating through a, a chain of code, um, which I'll show you a quick search. So this, no. Oh yeah, that's an interesting problem. Um, Yeah, so this code here is is what does all the magic. So I'm um, grabbing an event list of. Can everyone read that? Can you see it off the back? Yeah, good. Uh, so I'm creating a, a stream of events from all of the change and key up events from this query text box. So dollar sign represents jQuery, which is a, a 
JavaScript library that helps you like connect to the to the widgets on your page. Uh, and I've got this helper function which will create a sequence of all change events that will ever happen. And that's called changes. Uh, and inside just a normal closure let block, I'm taking all the changes and all of the key ups and concatenating them. Uh, concat star, I think I might actually rename because it, it doesn't quite follow the promise of what concat does. Concat normally takes one sequence and another sequence and puts the second one at the end of the first. This doesn't. This is merging them kind of as values come back. So it's a somewhat misleading name. Uh, but either way, I get this this uh, amalgamated list. Uh, hey? Is that the word? Multiplex? Multiplex? I like it. It sounds more futuristic. <laughs> so I get this super multiplex. Uh, let's just make that bigger. Um, of all the events. And then all of the events follow basically the same structure. But out of the whole event data structure, which contains like where it was triggered from, what time it was triggered, all of that, I don't really care about. All I care about is <coughs> what the value of the text field is. So I'm uh, composing two functions. I have a summarize function, which is up here. So this just pulls out some of the stuff I care about and puts it in a closure data structure. And then that's composed with the value function, uh, which gets me the value of the field at each of these events. Uh, so I'm using map D here. Um, the D at the end is wrapping it in a promise um, so that I don't need to. And that's because um, I'm not performing any kind of asynchronous com computation as part of this map. I'm just like, I've got all the information I need. I can just return straight away. Uh, so map D stars a convenience function. Uh, but once I've found out what my queries are going to be, I do actually want to perform some asynchronous computation. And so I go off and perform the search. Uh, and perform search is pretty straightforward. It's just a call to the standard jQuery get JSON function. Uh, and that returns back a promise for us. So it already satisfies what map wants, and map will put those promises onto a new sequence, which we call responses. And once we have the responses, uh, we just want to pull the group names out of those, which uh, doesn't look as straightforward as I hoped it would. Uh, but basically, the response is like a couple of nested um, hash map type objects. Uh, and I'm just looking a couple of steps inside that to pull out the name of each of the groups. <coughs> And of course, the, the response can have multiple groups. So I'm uh, mapping, uh, well, like uh, I get multiple values from each response. And then I use those to set the result list. Um, and the queries are used both to perform searches and to update uh, the page. So the kind of um, the style I've gone for here is that these three steps are all performing side effects. Um, and so I've got them in the body of the let, whereas all of this stuff is uh, basically functional. Um, and so I've got that up being given names. Um, and so, yeah, I, as I search... Why do you recommend in a function and then call in the function? Oh, uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, part uh, yesterday, I spent all of yesterday trying to hunt down uh, memory leaks in this code. Um, Hank has been kind of giving me uh, live feedback as I've been writing this code, and he thought he found a memory leak. Uh, and so I've been hunting through the code. It turned out that um, in a couple of places I had closures that were binding over the head of the sequence which meant that all of the values that I'd already processed couldn't be garbage collected because there was still some like lingering reference to them. So I needed to move those um, out into functions of their own so that they weren't uh, capturing the, the variables around them. 
Um, but all of that was kind of hidden because the way let behaves is like, I'm not sure if it's a bug, but it is kind of a problem. It generates JavaScript code that uh, defines variables at the top level, and so they don't disappear once the let block has run, which, yeah, like, uh, sorry, so not at the top level of, yeah, but at the, at in the, the global scope, but in the namespace. At the level of the let statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was able to debug this because the JavaScript code that's generated is quite readable. Like, if this was compiling down to assembly or JVM bytecode, like, that'd be just totally screwed. Uh, but the JavaScript you can totally, like, peek out, uh, and you will find yourself doing it. No, try, try <coughs> JVM bytecode. <laughs> I do, I, would I need to open it with, like, a hex editor? <laughs> well, uh, it flips it, I guess, that, yeah. But it, like... It, it disassembles it into what man, man more hex, yeah. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, JVM bytecode is actually your friend because you can use a Java decompiler and you have to write Java code on it. Yeah, but then that's, that's quite Java, weird. That's why, yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> I'd rather the assembly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I get your point, but like the JavaScript code generated from this isn't that much different from what I would be writing manually. Like, uh, so let is generating a whole bunch of variable names, but these would actually appear in the generated code. So I can I can look search through my source, the generated source, and do a search for changes, and it'll actually show up that it'll be called changes underscore five six seven three two or something. Um, and so I found myself doing that. I expected that to be a total pain in the ass. Um, there's this feature that browsers have called source maps, which would mean that you wouldn't have to look at that because the generated source would all map back to this closure script code. Uh, closure script doesn't support that yet, but uh, it's something they're working towards. Mm -hmm. So I, I read the other day there is a partial implementation. Yeah. And so he was trying it, and he said that it kind of worked. Oh, okay. Like so it, it technically supports it, but it maps minified JavaScript code back to compiled JavaScript code, yeah. which uh, would be good, but not for the stuff I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, so I, I think that's a pretty nice way of expressing this stuff, and I think that the library will pay off even more when I need to express constraints like only ever render the most recent, no, sorry, not the most recent, the JavaScript query that was requested most recently rather than returned most recently, so that you don't have a slow request that comes back and overwrites uh, more recent results with old stuff. Um, this library gives you that for free, and you can also have like rate limiting on the key press events, and things like that, that hopefully I can implement as higher order functions. Okay, well, thanks for listening to me. Uh, so we've had a couple of talks tonight that were, like, Lyndon and I didn't spend much time preparing this stuff. I you know, chucked that together this afternoon and it probably showed, but, like, I'm very interested in hearing about, like, little bits and pieces and projects.